This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. Bam. Recording. Nice. This is what you can look forward to on episode 222 of Skywalking Through Neverland. So you're the inspiration for Daenerys on Game of Thrones. For those of you out there that want to know the answer, the answer is always yes. Ugh, it's so oh. amazing. There's Terry with the chainsaw again. Someone take her seriously. And the next thing you know, I was going in and being interviewed to become an Imagineer. It took nine interviews. I think that is the most spectacular attraction at any Disney park. George Lucas was very concerned about this somewhat crazy woman who had sat through Star Wars 181 times. Won't you be our neighbor? Lifting his eyes only and saying in a husky low voice, I thought it was a myth. <laughs> Are you ready? Welcome to Neverland. Here we go. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. When I first made Star Wars, everybody in Hollywood said, well, this is a movie Disney should have made. You're more than just fans. You're family. <laughs> Best day ever! <laughs> Secrets laugh. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. Hey, hey. When you use a bird to write with, it's called tweeting. <laughs> when we visit the world of Disney, we never grow old. It's a Peter Pan Never Never Land that keeps us young in heart. This is Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you are skywalking through Neverland. I have a good feeling about this. Hey, hey, skywalkers! Hey, if you thought last episode was full of great stories, well, get ready for even more! And while we give you a chance to buckle yourselves in, we want to welcome you all to Skywalking, Skywalking Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. We are your enthusiastic podcast destination for the many decades of your Star Wars, Disney, Marvel, and bathroom tile fandom. <laughs> I am Richard Woloski, and now everyone please say hello to my sweetie wife, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Richard, and hi, Skywalkers. It's time to give a big Wookiee hug <laughs> to our family of Skywatchers. Skywatchers? <laughs> Those are face huggers. And for any of you out there in the in the fandom of bathroom tiles, uh -huh. you came to the right place. Or just tile in general, because you can put tile in the kitchen, you can put tile on your walls, you can put tile in your house, but right now... We're putting tile in our bathroom, for and anyone, it's really exciting. For anyone following us on Facebook, you'll know what that means, because right now, what's what's happening, Sarah? What's on, happening right outside this door? And on Instagram, my mermaid bathroom is appearing. It's amazing. It's really fun. So, yeah, uh, my, on my Facebook, Sarah Woloski, or on my Instagram, Jedi Tink, you can see the progress of the photos. So if you're hearing anything right now outside, outside this door... I'm not sure if you can if it's being picked up, but they're hammering and tiling and doing what they're doing right outside. Yeah. So every once in a while, you may hear a buzz saw or <laughs> grout. What kind of sound does grout make? Mm, gloop, gloop, gloop. Or, or the installation of bathroom equipment banging I, around. Yeah. Actually, I think right now he is putting the last two tile pieces in place for the whole bathroom. Now, it still needs to be grouted, but... But he's actually, you know, the cutting and everything is all done. And, and it's awesome because, because it's this really cool, like, white-ish tile, but it's shimmery. And then you have mermaid scales as a fun, as a fun, uh, uh, what do you call it? Accent. It's the accent tile. And then the, the base tile, the flooring, is just this little patch because it's a very small bathroom. And it's like pebbles like at the beach. So it's like the beach, and then you go in the ocean, and you meet you meet Ariel. As see, well. see you tile fans out there. We <laughs> said come right here for your tile fandom, and we did not disappoint, did that's we? That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's move on with this with this show here. Okay. Because coming up on this episode, we have part two of our discussion with the ever energetic Star Wars super fan slash Imagineer. Slash Mother of Dragons, <laughs> slash Ghostbuster Terror Dog, uh. and the woman who made Steven Sansweet whip out his checkbook 
faster than Han Solo drew his blaster on Darth Vader. <laughs> or or on uh, Sam... No, in, in Solo, he draws his blaster really fast Oh, at the very end. <laughs> at Beckett. At Beckett, thank okay. you. All right. Yeah. Another so good fast call. that we're like, wait, Another... did, he, did he have it up there? <laughs> I know. Another good call. <laughs> All right, even after these two parts of our discussion with Terry Harden, we still didn't get to her work on Star Tours and Captain EO. But 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 if you listen to the bloopers at the end, she gives uh-huh. a little bit of a nugget yes. on Star Tours, but the full story is coming coming when? Well, okay. So, I mean, she has so many great stories and this episode is full of them, but we'll get to the Star Tours and Captain EO maybe for our next Star Tours anniversary <gasps> episode in January. Oh, so And that's just going to come fast faster than you know it. <laughs> yeah, it's already the end of August. Mhm. Right now, it's Kenny Baker's birthday eve. <gasps> That's how late in August we are. <laughs> All right. We also have shout-outs and a happy beep from our own Skywalker, Christopher Marino. Christopher Marino, incidentally, says someone was thinking Sam Beckett of Quantum Leap. I think I was. because I No, Tobias Beckett. Right, I know. But, but that name has more meaning for me. Oh, from Solo. Okay. Okay. What, right. Well, Sam Beckett from Quantum Leap. All right. That's Let's funny. get back on track here and tell you that we are recording from our bedroom in Long Beach, California on August the 23rd, 2018. Mm-hmm. And Sarah, why are we recording from our bedroom? Well, because they're working on the bathroom, which is right next to our offices. So it's hard to record there because then you'd hear all this noise. I know in the past we've recorded at the beach mm-hmm. by our pool. Yep. At the Cerritos Community Center. And also we're recording from our bathroom because this is one of the one bedroom. rooms. Not, in, we're not recording I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> someday we will. No. <laughs> but we're, yes. Yeah. For you Tile fans, someday we will, we will record in the bathroom so you can hear how audio reflects <sighs> off of those pebble tiles. Yes. Okay. Well, well sa- sa- oh, come on. Tell them the real reason because you want to show off this. It may. <laughs> Look well, at that. Well, if people listening, tell them what we're looking at. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my my uh, uh oh my gosh beauty and the beast tapestry which is right behind the bed and i love it it's fabulous and now and this is one of the more calming spaces in our house right now that's actually finished and complete so it's nice to be in here mm-hmm. as well as the kitchen and sarah makes the bed every morning while, yes. while, while i make breakfast yeah all right do you know what else i want to know sarah <gasps> what what time is it Uh oh what what time is it huh what's many many can you hear me what time is it? When is the pool party at the Woloskis? Says Margaret Mays on Facebook. Uh, ooh, may- when? I don't know. Do we want to say Labor Day? Mm. That could be something. Oh, that could be fun. Yeah, maybe a Labor ooh. Day skywalking meetup. We used to have those all the time. That would be cool. All right, let's let's put a pin in that for right now. Let's put a pin in that and let's ask Minnie what time it is. It's two forty-five. Good afternoon. Boy, it is late in the day. It, it is, is but... late in the day. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> and it's also time. <gasps> it's time to hear a happy beep from Chris Marino. One of my biggest joys in fandom is to be able to enjoy it with my two boys. And I always wanted one day, when I when I first had kids, was one day hopefully to see Star Wars in the theater with them. So in 2012, when they re-released Phantom Menace in 3D, I made sure to, f- to fly to where they live in Iowa and saw it with them. It was a great experience, and I loved every minute of it. You know, at the time, who knew they were going to be make more movies? And now that they do... We always see every Star Wars movie together, and it is such a great experience. And I love every moment of it. I wouldn't change anything. My kids love Star Wars, no matter what. Also, one of the other great things is the Skywalker family. You guys have been amazing in every way. I Celebration in 2017 was one of the best experiences of my life. Being able to meet all the people from everywhere, I loved it. 
it was so great. I still have, I still think about it all the time. It makes me so excited for Chicago to be able to see everyone again and hopefully meet new, uh, other Skywalkers and other people and bringing my kids this time and introduce them to everybody. And uh, I, I don't care what happens out there in the crazy social media world. Star Wars is, I will always love it. And it's because of people, all the Skywalker people, and because of my kids. Thanks. All right, Skywalkers, well, we still want to hear your happy beeps. So record a one, one and a half minutes of what makes you really happy in fandom. Mm-hmm. And then yes. email it over to us at share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. And just so you know, on your on your super duper awesome phones, you can just record a voice memo. And when you've done recording that, you can just hit the little share button and email it. It's really cool. Yes. What makes you happy in fandom? All right. Now, Sarah, let's pump this podcast up to 11 with Terry Harden, Star Wars super fan, Disney Imagineer, and so much, much more. Won't you join us, Skywalkers? <laughs> Won't you be our neighbor? Be our guest, be our guest, put our podcast to the test. Gather around the microphone and we will do the rest. So now, Terry, let's go back to the beginning and how you pulled off seeing Star Wars so many times in the theater. Star Wars, I went, I was, I snuck in to see Star Wars. <laughs> you, you had to pay for each ticket. I couldn't afford that. So I ducked into the bathroom and changed my clothes and my hair. So I just <laughs> didn't do it. And on my 64th viewing, I got caught. Uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good odds. Yeah, the guy said, uh, you want to know how I caught you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, same bag. Uh, you had the same bag. I was like, ah, uh, 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 He said, what's so important? And I said, this is the movie. This is movie's going to change my life, blah, blah, blah. So he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll let you and a guest see it as many times as you want. As long as when you hit your 100th view, I can use it for publicity's sake. Wow. So on that 100th viewing, uh, news and everyone was there to talk to me. They cut the soundbite down to, I've seen Star Wars a hundred over a hundred times. And uh, this is my 100th viewing, whatever, yada, yada. And I looked like some kind of a nut. <laughs> uh, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't air why. They didn't air any of that. They just wanted that bite. But while I was there, they gave me the happy birthday poster. Uh, wow. And they gave me the poster that hangs the, the, the six face poster of Princess Leia and Luke and Han that was uh. in their case that showed the six faces at the Chinese. And I still have that wow. on the back is signed by Anthony Daniels and David Prowse, uh. and <laughs> Penny Baker. They signed it for me. And I know the the happy birthday poster is the one that Steve stands sand sweet. Wanted, yes, right? It was his holy the, grail with the cake and all well, the action figures, yeah. the tender action figures around it. No, the happy birthday <laughs> poster, the one year poster. No. Which one are you talking about then? Oh, you want me to tell you that story before Captain? <laughs> sure, sure. Let's, let's go there too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this this is gonna be a three parter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know they they should have never put us together. If they didn't want us to talk Star Wars. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we have all day. Stephen Sansweet. Well, now, I had a very, very dear friend who said, if you want your collection to be evaluated by the best, you need Stephen Sansweet. Now, before we talk about my meeting with dear Stephen, let us go back into time. Remember I said that, and this is not the poster, but I must tell you this as well. I told you that when you find it, your right. body shakes, your stomach gets funny, right. and you begin to sweat. I was at a thrift store on Lancashire Boulevard when there were <laughs> such things. I walked into the thrift store just because I love them, and I went to the very back and there was something covered in dust. And when I blew away the dust, much like Indiana Jones blows away the dust to see whether or not he's going to be able to take that gold, golden medallion, jealous statue thing, 
I saw underneath the Mylar poster introducing Coming uh, to Your Galaxy this summer. Oh, uh, at a thrift store? At a thrift store. Oh, that that is the holy grail. It was unbelievable. And it wasn't the thin Mylar one. It was the heavy-duty, plastic-reinforced one. And just like you can imagine, I began to feel faint. My mm. my pulse started to go rapid as I rolled it up and tucked it under my arm. I carefully oh. slid it across to the man behind the counter, and I said, How much for this old thing? <laughs> uh, way to downplay it. Yeah. And he said, It's a poster. Five dollars. <gasps> Wow. That's exactly my reaction. <laughs> here here you go. Here's 10. Keep the change. I could not get the money out fast enough. <laughs> and that whole thing had to be very cool and casual. But I cannot tell you how I walked out of that store, ducked around the corner, and did the happy dance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I could not believe it. And that was the beginning of my Star Wars one sheet collection. But that well, was not it. the poster that Sansweet wanted. Mm. Oh, Remember okay. I said when I was there in line for all those times and everybody was interviewing that people from all over the world sent me posters. Yes. And one of them was from Lucasfilm. Okay, here we go. Buckle up, you're in for a bumpy ride. <laughs> Steve Sansweet knocks on my door He's going to come in my home And evaluate my collection I'm sure he's a little tired And he's a little bored Maybe he's done this for several people <laughs> But he hasn't met this nut Yours truly <laughs> He knows he's in for a treat When I hand him a set of envelopes Inside those envelopes Are every single Comic that ran in the L.A. Times when they decided to do Star Wars as a comic. Do you remember that, Richard? Yeah, as a daily strip. That and started they in did 78. That. I don't they remember that. that. They did that for like four years. Wow. Including yeah. Sunday when it was yeah. in color. Yeah, I, I used to go to my neighbors and steal their paper, cut it out, and return the, the Boston Globe right after. You see what I mean? <laughs> Now, and Steven, I still have those two. Stephen had collected a few, but I had every single one. Wow. All of a sudden, I think he blinked and said, what in the world have I gotten into? <laughs> I smiled at him and said, did you bring your checkbook? And he said, I am the biggest Star Wars collector in the world. There is nothing you are going to be able to sell me today because I have it. I have most of it. And I said, you don't have this. Did you bring your checkbook? <laughs> he says, I'm telling you. I said, just answer the question, please. Yes, I brought my checkbook. Good, good. Please be seated. So I started to go through my collection. One of the things that I got that he did buy was a Empire Express card. This is a green American Express card, except for instead it says Empire Express. And in place Ooh. of the Trojan has Darth Vader. Oh. This was done by a collector who decided wow. to sell them at an event during the convention. And, of course, I had to have one, so I got one. I think it cost me a buck. Stephen paid. Stephen got it for free because he bought a program for, that I had for a – I was invited to see Empire Strikes Back by Gary Kurtz to serve – to help with his foundation – and I had a Darth Vader program. And since Steve and Sansweet knows these people, he wanted that. I said, it's a hundred bucks. He bought it. Right. Mm. And I, and he said, so, okay, you happy? I bought something. You, you got something that I didn't have. And I said, well, that's a bonus for me because that's not it. Yeah. And, uh, he looked through everything. Some of the things I had and sold was this, the, the theme from Star Wars, da, na, da, na, 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 playing on every single instrument from the pan flute to the accordion. And uh, a pipe organ. And just about every way you could hear it, I had an instrument playing it. And the vinyls were right there in front of him. Crazy stuff. Crazy, crazy stuff. 
Mm-hmm. And he looked at my one sheets, including the Gone with the Wind poster, very popular at the time mm-hmm. I didn't know, but then the uh, uh, Revenge of the Jedi, the uh, uh, what else? The birthday poster, except for my birthday poster that was sent to me, was sent to me by the printer, and it was a printer's proof, which meant it had the colors along the side, making it more valuable because it was the daddy that all the little baby birthday posters were born. Wow. So things like this. Finally, I said to Steve, would you like to see it? (gasps) And he says, what? And I said, would you like to see what you're going to buy for me today? And he looked at me and he said, I'm not. And I held my finger up. Don't say it. Don't say it until you see. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. (sighs) He says, yeah, yeah, bring it on. So... (laughs) I walk over and I pull a small sheet of paper, stationary it is, and at the top of the stationary it says Lucasfilm. Mm. Underneath it says, Dear Terry, I happened to see you on television the other day and learned that you collect one sheets. You stood in line for three days fighting for what you believe and I could think there was no one better to receive this gift. In your hands, you hold one of two remarkable posters. These two posters are the only thing that remain of the billboards that were originally supposed to go up advertising The Empire Strikes Back. (laughs) Two weeks ago, two weeks before the movie was released, The Gone with the Wind billboard slash banner was replaced with Darth Vader's Starfield. Oh. I, who remain nameless, have burned every single poster but two. One of which you hold in your hands. Sincerely, Anonymous, George Lucas Productions. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And how fast did Steve Sansweet whip out his checkbook or credit card? (laughs) Steve Sansweet sat for a long moment. All of a sudden, sweat, one bead, (laughs) dribbled from his forehead along his nose and onto my floor. Lifting his eyes only and saying in a husky low voice, I thought... It was a myth. (gasps) This is a myth. Uh, This isn't true. uh, It can't be true. It can't be true. Wow. Smiling, I said, would you like to see it? I can only open one panel because Uh, it's nine by 13 feet. Whoa. And I'm getting nervous about keeping it. Because the corners are starting to become a little frayed. Because I can't open it. It's too Mm. big. And he said, he, yeah, open it. (laughs) And I opened the part where Han Solo has Leia in the embrace, that beautiful watercolor side. Mm. And I said, This is panel one. Stephen, how much is this worth? Well, Stephen couldn't speak for a while, probably a good minute or two, because he now was in the same position I was at that thrift store, only I wasn't telling him it would cost $5. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Add some more zeros onto that. I said to him, you're the best person to ask how much this is worth. After all, you really are the authority. Uh, and he said, it's, it's priceless, Terry. It's wow. Pr- you got you to gotta put this up in auction, and it's priceless. I said, how much would you pay? He said, oh, no, 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 no. I just told you it was priceless. I said, that was not my question, Stephen. My question was, how much would you pay? 
seven, five. I can't say. I said, Stephen, we're not going any further until you tell me. <sighs> so he gave me a number. And I accepted it. <laughs> it was only four digits. That's all I'm going to tell you. It was not six digits. It was not ten digits. It was just four digits and then zero, zero for the change. Mm. Stephen looked up in absolute befuddlement. Why would you sell this to me when I have told you this is priceless? Well, you both know out there in skywalking through Neverland <laughs> why I sold it to Stephen Sansweet. I sold it to Stephen Sansweet because I said, you are getting it because you are the greatest and you have the most, you have the largest Star Wars collection in the world. So I wanted you to have it. I needed to sell it. Couldn't give it to you. And all I ask it in the corner in a little plate, you just acknowledge that you, I'm the one you found it. And he said, no problem. And the whole time he wrote the check, he said, my wife is going to kill me. My wife is going to kill me. My wife is going to kill me. But he wrote the check. And he bought the poster. Wow. Yeah, pretty chilling, huh? It was it was amazing. It was just amazing. And he just couldn't believe it. He, he, was, he was in shock. Have you ever been to Rancho Obi-Wan to see it? No. No, oh. I haven't. I have. Well, see, yeah, we, now what's awesome is like so many fans, Star Wars fans from around the world are enjoying that poster yes. right, all the time. So, yeah, so the next time we're there, we'll have to tell Steven, hey, yes. you know, we know you have this poster. Yes. Uh, let's, let's crack that open, okay? Yeah. That, that crazy girl that we uh, heard. I mean, it was such a joy to see his face and it needed to be where it, its home needed to be with Steven. Yeah. That's Definitely. where it belonged. Yeah, absolutely. It belonged there. So... Uh. So I was so happy to that that he walked through my door, not because I I said you know pigeon, um, but yeah. that that I knew that my poster was going to be safe. Yeah. And when was this? What year? Oh gosh, I can't even remember. It was someday. It was definitely after Revenge of the Jedi became Return of the Jedi a few years after that, because I had several revenge posters that I asked him to authenticate, because okay. there were so many bootlegs, you know. So we're talking mid eighties. Yeah, probably, or even later. Might have been around two thousand when we met. Um, he had written several books, so I'm not exactly sure when we actually came together. But I was still I two thousand four is when I moved from my home into my husband's home, and everything became you know tucked away in the garage. And and Stephen had bought it before then. I was so happy that he bought it because. Because I could never, I opened it one time and then I folded it up and you know how you are. You put it away because you don't mm -hmm. want to keep opening it. It had to be folded. It was huge. Yeah, you got to fold yes. it with cotton gloves. You got to put it in a room <laughs> that's going to be hermetically sealed with no sunlight. And at that point, you, you really should sell it yeah. or give to someone who can enjoy it. Well, and I knew, I knew Stephen... Stephen would put one of those wonderful cloth backings that protects the posters that they do nowadays that is an archival way for people to preserve these beautiful art pieces uh, in the one sheets that yeah. happened. So, yeah, that was just that was just a great, a really good day for me. Yes, I sold it. But more importantly, Stephen got it. And that was really what I wanted to have happen is I wanted him to walk away with it. He he. He doesn't know what that means to me. I could have had it sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I get that. But I wanted it to go to someone who would pay it the respect and take care of it like it needed to be taken care of. You know, maybe someone out there would have done it, but there's no guarantee. Well, it did go to a good place. We've been to Rancho Obi-Wan quite a few times, and it could not be in safer hands. Now, I'd like to circle back to the Empire Strikes Back one sheet poster you had won in the Bantha Tracks contest. Now, who signed that? I, everybody signed it, including the elusive George Lucas, who Ooh. was not going to sign. Gary Kurtz signed it, but I took it because Brian Henson had signed it. Br he had only Brian signed Henson. It. Yeah, Brian Henson had had something. Well, Brian Henson had to do with Yoda. 
Really? I did not so know this. So Henson Puppeteers did, worked on, you know, because you Frank Oz is. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't know that, that Brian Henson worked on Yoda. Yeah, he did. In fact, he helped with the uh, costuming he helped on, of Yoda. He helped. His his team did did quite a bit, but his mm-hmm. name was on there. But I, I bought I grabbed it because someone from, and it was signed by all the, the crew, the very little cast, mostly crew signed this poster. And one of the crew members on one of the posters, it was a right, there was a rhino records, like little rhino at the bottom. And he had drawn the rhino and signed his name. So I wanted it because of that. Uh-huh. And also because Joe Johnston, he had put his name over Darth Vader's hand that's outstretched. <laughs> so it looked like it was levitating his name. So that's why I took that one. I think I got the best poster. Now, which which poster is this? I This is style B. So what does it's that the, mean? It's the light blue poster with the large Vader in the middle with his outstretched hand. There's okay. Luke and the Tauntaun over to the side and the heads of Han and Leia. Is it the Han and Leia? No, not that one. Okay. No, it's not the Gone with the Wind poster. I okay. know that's the yeah. one you're thinking of. And that it's... Gone with the Wind poster uh, netted me more money than I could possibly imagine when I finally sold it at the auction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the light blue Empire Strikes Back poster. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's the one. And it was framed in my house for quite some time. And then, and then I got married and uh, my husband said, could we... Could we not have Star Wars in the house? Could we have original art in the house? And I said, yeah, that's that's fine. And the reason I finally took it to auction was because I had dreams of water damage or rat infestation or mm. things because it wasn't being displayed. And I had met Stephen Sansweet some years before and had sold him my creme de la creme, even though he told me, he was the largest Star Wars collector in the world. I kept telling him, well, I hope you brought your checkbook because mm. you're going to write a check for me before uh, the day is through. He got he got my, my creme de la creme poster. All right, j- just so we're clear, your creme de la creme is not the Empire one sheet. You had one from Bantha Tracks. That one was sold at the Profiles in History auction in 2007. But now this is another prize possession, right? Yeah. All right, got it. When I stood in line in Empire Strikes Back, I mentioned to you that People started arriving at 9, and by the next day, Tuesday morning, I could see the end of the line from where I was sitting. It had wrapped It had wrapped completely around the building. Whoa. Well, yeah. and here's what happened. People started to interview me at 6 o'clock in the morning, Tuesday morning, wanting to know how early I had got there and why. I was half asleep, and I said I had seen the movie 181 times, and that opened a Pandora's box. I was mm. interviewed hundreds of times. And the L.A. Times, that's how that book right there, Galaxy, all their own, happened. Right. Wow. And yeah, because that was put together by the L.A. Times. Well, you really and, are the first Star Wars super fan. <laughs> well, and I, 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 I'm trying to reach the L.A. Times because I would really love for them to do a follow-up story of where I am now. Because what you're looking at in that book is a hopeful. Mm-hmm. It's, an artist who, it's an artist who's still looking to become to do what she loves for a living. Yeah. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to do what I love for a living. And there I was standing, you know, there because I had this wild idea that I deserved this first ticket. And um, there were new, there was news coverage coast to coast and people said, well, what do you do? And I said, I collect the movie one sheets. And as a result, I got one sheets from all over the world. Once that was done, I got some of my favorite posters from Poland, from China, from uh, Empire Strikes Back, from Italy, from Japan, Australia. And then I got one from Lucasfilm. And that's the one that Sansweet ended up buying. Oh, wow. You know what? I guess you can say that you... You have done something that you have really enjoyed or you were gearing up toward, and that's working in the film and TV industry. Yeah, so mm-hmm. let's let's jump ahead and talk about your amazing film and TV career. What like what did you work on? Well, the first movie that I was given the opportunity to work on was that Rick Baker told me about a man named Lane Liska. Oh, and of course, Star Wars fans will know Lane Liska as a cantina creature maker, and he's actually the guy inside of the of the Muftak costume. 
Yeah. So okay. we worked on a movie that was just awful called Journey to the Center of the Earth. <laughs> and it it wasn't the one that people know about. If you can find this movie, Rusty Lemerand was the producer. And it was just a crazy movie, crazy, crazy, silly movie. But I built these creatures that were supposed to be the underworld creatures. And I hired, I was responsible for training and hiring um, men to wear the outfits. And uh, my shortest guy was 6'5". My tallest was 7'3". Wow. Mm. So my team of giant tall guys playing these characters was very interesting. And then I got to build these characters. And from there, I went on to do a film called Dune. Oh, in 84. Yeah. And uh, it was funny because I worked in foam, F-O-A-M, the stuff you find inside your seat cushions. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was sculpting this was because I couldn't afford clay and casting. Well, by the time Dune came around and they were a friend of mine said, Terry, you ought to take your portfolio over there. They're looking for people that work in foam. And I said, no, they can't possibly. It's a movie. Nobody works in foam. But sure enough, they they were very impressed with all of my foam sculpting work. And they said, this is the way we do it now. And I was like, shut the front door. I'll be <laughs> I'm thinking I want to do this clay stuff. And it's, I don't need to do this clay stuff. So I was brought on to work with with some amazing people. Mark Stetson, who's responsible for a lot of the model work of various films like Ghostbusters, which was the next one I ended up doing. There was just uh, uh, Bob Ringwood who designed those costumes for Dune. I ended up making those costumes with a great team of, of artists and experts. Years before that, I went to the opening of the original Star Trek the motion picture. Mm. Ended up sitting at the table with Gene Roddenberry and the entire cast of Star Trek, which for me was a dream come true. Because as I told you, they were responsible for keeping me sane when there was nothing else to watch. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so I started to do film and TV work. Ghostbusters was my first huge, seriously big break. However, Dune was pretty good. I stunt doubled for Sean Young. I oh. wore her outfit <laughs> while she was comfortable in the trailer. I did a lot of the running and a lot of the jumping in Mexico where it was really, really hot and uncomfortable. Mm. But uh, but then I went on to, to do Ghostbusters. And what happened is I took my portfolio in to do Ghostbusters. And they asked me if a woman performed the dog that Sigourney Weaver turns into, would she have, would this dog have feminine qualities? For those of you out there that want to know the answer, the answer is always yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if someone asks you if you're a god, you say, say yes. 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 When someone asks you if you're a god, you Say yes, <laughs> and that's what I did. And I got in and I performed it. They were very impressed. And the next thing you know, I was this character. Wow. Then, yeah, so you were Zool, right? Is that that's the dog? I name? was. I was the. I was the. Um, no. I guess I was the the terror the gate, dog gatekeeper at because okay. Moranus was the key master, right? Yes. Yeah. So I was the gatekeeper dog, and he was the key, and he turns into the key master dog. Oh, okay, okay. And yeah. I'm the one in the refrigerator that, that terrifies Sigourney Weaver. Wow. Oh, really? And I'm the one in dig- the doorway that's waiting for her as the arms grab her and take her into the doorway. And she oh. actually turns oh. into the dog. And then my dear friend, William Bryant, who's going to be at the Hollywood show I just found out this weekend. I will not, but he will. Um, William Bryant did the Marshmallow Man. Oh. And, <laughs> and Bill and I, as I call him, we had been... We had done several things together, including Dune. So he brought me on to help build the Marshmallow Man, and I puppeteered the face. Mm. So uh, so I did Marshmallow Man in the face, and then I worked a little bit on Librarian Ghost because puppeteers are always a team, as you know, Richard. So no one puppeteer ever does one character unless they are Kermit the Frog. But uh, <laughs> most of the time, they're much more massive than Slimer was. Someone did mm. Slimer's face while... My friend Mark Will- Wilson played Slimer from the original Ghostbusters. And then Bill was in the suit of the Marshmallow Man while I puppeteered the face along with a couple of others. And then the monster dog, I was inside the monster dog while someone did the eyes on wow. that dog. So 
<laughs> that, that is incredible. I know. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It was fantastic. And then one thing led to another movie, movie, movie. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm trying to get in to be an Imagineer. Later, I become an Imagineer and I've been one ever since. Um, I, I don't work at the company anymore, but I am considered an independent contractor. So when they need someone, they ask me to come in and work. And when they don't, they tell me, get away, get away. <laughs> wow. So now what kind of work have you done as an Imagineer? I designed the Dragon's Lair in Paris. Ugh, that's so oh. amazing. Yeah, I was very fortunate we, to get that. We were like, so I think that's the most memorable part of Disneyland Paris is that Dragon's Lair. Yeah, oh, thank definitely. You, yeah. Thank you for saying that. And um, yeah, and that's, it was that a, scared me. Oh, I know. It that's, was a blessing. It was a blessing to get that. I had to really, really work hard to get that because Disney usually likes the person designing it going over to Paris and they knew they wouldn't send a woman because it's very challenging for a woman to get men over in the European countries at that time to mm. listen to them. If it's not, you know, a oh. woman thing, that's all I'm going to say, you know, laugh and plaster bill. This is, <laughs> but it was a man's world for me from the very beginning as, as a woman in the film industry, I had to make a decision what type of woman I was going to be. And right. I wasn't, I was kind of one of the guys, but I had to be a little bit tougher. So you would find me wielding a chainsaw and a machete to carve something for Disney without any second thoughts of doing it. And that kind of let people know that I was a force to be reckoned with. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it's funny. It's funny. There's Terry with the chainsaw again. Someone take her yeah. seriously. <laughs> yeah. So you worked on the dragon. Which, yes. Which, which so, part of the dragon? So here was when, the way it went. And I will try again to be brief, which you see, I just can't seem to do it. <laughs> but I had tried very, very, very hard to be an Imagineer. I wanted to be an Imagineer. I liked the idea of designing the parks. Blaine Gibson was my hero. And I just wanted so much to be him. Mm. So I kept applying and kept applying and kept applying. In fact, I have so many rejection letters with that mouse and the sorcerer's hat <laughs> that I was beginning to hate him an awful lot. And uh, I can wallpaper my entire 1,500 square foot house with all of the rejection letters, but I just kept going. And one day I decided to stop. I said, I'm going to put this away for a few months, and then I'm going to attack it again. And I went to sculpt for a friend of mine who makes those walk around characters like Charlie Tuna and Smokey the Bear and McGruff the Crime Dog. And wow. I was sculpt I was sculpting McGruff the Crime Dog heads and Smokey the Bear heads and Panda pie for some place in Thailand and et cetera, et cetera. When a friend of mine walked into this little place because the Disney Tahunga building was just down the parking lot from us. And uh, he said, Terry, what are you doing here? And I said, waiting to become an Imagineer. <laughs> but meanwhile, I'll do this for my friend. He said, what do you mean you're trying to become Imagineer? And I was like, well, I have all these rejection letters. I even got one of those blue certificates that was supposed to guarantee me an interview and it didn't happen. So I decided to put it on hold until magic happens. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. They need people. And the next thing you know, I was going in and being interviewed for to become an Imagineer. It took nine interviews Whoa. and three months. Boy, they're not messing around. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking to myself, seriously, this is like adopting a stray dog. <laughs> Boy, and they have so many Imagineers. How much time do they spend interviewing? Oh, yeah, and what year was this? Was in this was 1977. Uh, no, 1987. Okay. So in 87, I'm standing there going, you got to be freaking kidding me that this is taking this long. They got to figure out that they want me. But I was jumping through interview, more people, interview, more people. I was like, you know, my first interview, the guy says to me when I'm carrying my portfolio, why aren't you in a skirt? This is a job interview. Uh, like, excuse me, dude, but I crawl, climb all over, met, I climb all over models and operate a cherry picker. I need to be in slacks. Right. <laughs> I've been inside of a terror dog. You can't do yeah. that in a skirt. No. Forget the skirt, dude. <laughs> you know what? Unless there's a few things you want to tell me about you that I would prefer you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
So <laughs> sure enough, I had been through eight interviews and trying like the devil. I mean, imagine if you will, that this is finally, you're getting the opportunity to get the job, one of the jobs you really want to do. And you're like, I, I just don't want to take anything because as soon as I take something, you know, they're going to call. I'm going to get that call. And, and I'm sitting Always. there starving. Yes. Saying to myself, you know, come on, this has got to happen. And you're not, you're, you're just going to laugh because I get a call from Dolly Parton. Oh. <laughs> wow. As, how, one, how, as, as how, one does. Yeah. I was like, how often do you say this in your life? <laughs> I know, right? Hello, Dolly Parton calling. And Dolly Parton was doing a Christmas special. And she wanted to know, she had gotten my name from the guy who was in charge of the puppets to be a puppeteer on her Christmas special. And she said, do you want to do it? I said, yes. <laughs> and the reason I did it was because it was over that two-week Christmas holiday. We were going to shoot there. I go, surely Imagineering won't hire me or talk to me during those two weeks. This will allow me to get some money on the table and be able to extend enough that I can wait for my Imagineering job. Uh -oh. Sure enough, Disney calls. Oh, ah! no. I'm standing in my chiropractor's office when Disney calls. Huh? And uh, Disney says, uh, we have one more interview. And then we will decide whether or not we want to hire you. And uh, they put it right smack dab in the middle of Dolly's show. Oh, no. And I said, I can't, I can't come in. I'm sorry. I think eight interviews is enough, but I took another job. You've strung me along for a few months. And quite frankly, if you can't decide by then, I don't know what to tell you. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if you don't come to this interview, you're out of the running. And I blew a gasket. Ugh. Oh, no. I lost my ever-loving mind. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> Disney, you guys live in fantasy land. You don't even know what it's like to do a job interview. How dare you treat people like this? I cannot believe you run this company. How did you ever get anything done? <laughs> <laughs> and I slammed the phone. I hung up the, I don't need you. Hung up the phone. Two days later, they hired me. Whoa! <laughs> There's a lesson right there. Wow! And I said to him, "Stand I said, your ground." If, if all I had to do was yell at you, I would have done it. You know, <laughs> right? Seven interviews ago. <laughs> <laughs> During so the you... introduction, <laughs> hi, I'm Terry Harden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And understand that when I work here, I, you know, I could yeah. be all, you know, pompous. And then when I went on my uh, they do an orientation where they take you through Disney Studios and then they take you through Imagineering and they talk about the films and you get to meet various heads of the place. It's it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. And when I got to my where I was going to first start, which is the rock work division, the first piece I worked on was Big Thunder Paris. Mm -hmm. And I was to carve the rocks for that. And a lot of sculptors said, well, that's a boring job. And I said, have you ever sculpted rocks? Mm. And they said, well, no. And I said, then shut up then. Because uh, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. It's actually quite challenging to sculpt bet. rocks for Disney. And rocks in general, because God is God. And you cannot sculpt and you're not. <laughs> rocks. Yeah, seriously. You cannot sculpt rocks like you sculpt anything else. You have to stop about halfway to your finishing point. And a lot of sculptors right now will be saying, what? But that's, it. I don't know how else to tell you. This is what you, you have to do. You have to stop halfway through. And it was just fascinating once it clicks and you learn this. And I love learning things. Mm -hmm. So when I was sculpting Big Thunder and I realized this is what I had to do, it was joyful. But when I walked in, the supervisor ran, picked me up, twirled me around and said, finally, the phone queen is here. <laughs> and I was like, uh hello? <laughs> you know, and they said, we thought it was going to, wh what took so long and you getting hired? And I said, well, it wasn't my fault. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah. I said, you should have talked to more people because they almost did not hire me. And they said, what? You are a number one pick. And they went on and on. And it was very sweet for them to say so. And then they put me right on Big Thunder, where when you go to Paris and you see the arch on Big Thunder, that's mine. 
Oh, and wow. uh, that it's it, there's nothing. I got to tell you guys, there's nothing like sailing under something you've designed. <laughs> yeah, or, you know? or being scared to death by the dragon because when yes. when Sarah and I were there on our honeymoon, w- the dragon was just phenomenal mm-hmm. to watch. And then it was phenomenal to watch the kids as they would walk through the caverns. Yeah. All of a sudden, they would see this dragon coming toward them. They would just scream in something in French and run. <laughs> yeah, we stayed in there for quite a while because it's so interesting to watch other people respond to it. Because the dragon is like in the background. You don't even know he's there. Yeah. But when he starts yeah. moving, it's, 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 it is actually terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Have you watched the watch reactions people? from people? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't get to go there till 2000. Oh, wow. <laughs> because uh, they did not send me over to build it. But what they did do is give me a lovely man who I had to tell and show all of the designs I had. Now, originally, that dragon wasn't supposed to move. Mm. Oh, no. Whoa. Yeah. Um, I had worked on Big Thunder, and I had had some challenges with the person I was building Big Thunder with. And later, it was confessed to me that he had difficulty all the people in that division had difficulty working with this fellow. Mm. And they thought because I was such a bubbly person, I'd be fine. And uh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't go into detail, but I will say that it was a challenge for me. And finally, I at Disney, they want you to go up the, up the ladder, you know. So if you have a grievance, you go to person A and person B and person C. And then you're brought into a little room and you guys settle your differences. In the film industry, I just walk up to you and say, stay off of my stuff. <laughs> um, you know, you you. What about Disney? Gonna take it to Stitch. Stitch takes it to Goofy. Goofy yeah, takes it yeah, to Pluto. Yeah. Pluto takes it to <laughs> I mean, yeah. Mickey eventually. Yeah. Corporate. Jiminy Cricket gets in there. <laughs> yeah. And says, you know, it's okay. It's okay. You're you're a good person. <laughs> yeah, Mickey. Oh, we can settle it. <laughs> yeah. But but I just said, oh, you gotta be kidding me. You know, why can't I just talk to him? They go, no, no, no. It's not the way it's handled. Mm. So I went into this meeting, and he was friends with the with the boss and they started this good old boy stuff made me want to, mm. Oh, it was awful. But the thing he said at the end, like I said, I won't go into detail, but, uh, uh, at the end he said, now I really think the two of you are big enough that you can handle this yourselves. And I remember gripping the table I was sitting on saying, thank you, Jesus. Because after the guy, as the door snicked closed behind mm. Mr. Boss man, I spun on this fella grabbed him by the shirt and said, I block what I block, you block what you block, I carve what I ca- I carve what I block, you carve what you block, you do not carve what I block, I am not your grunt, I am your co-worker. And if you don't want to find me rolling on the floor beating the ever-loving you-know-what out of you in front of dignitaries, you better start introducing me. Are we clear? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> That's yeah. what I said. And he looked at me and he said, he said, Wow. Okay. And I said, <laughs> great. So after that, we got along just fine. We did, mm. we did very well. I said, you know, basically treat me with respect as I'm treating you. He did. And we got along very well, but I went to my supervisor and I said, I did a favor for you. Now you must do one for me. And, uh, I looked through all the things that were going to be done in Paris and saw the dragon. I adore dragons and said, mine, 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 nice. mine, mine, and he said, well, it's not that great of a project, Terry, it's <gasps> not moving, and I said, what, <laughs> say that again, and he said, it's just going to be a stone dragon, and it's the hub because it snows in Paris, and I said, whoa, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what a waste, I said, Every- dude. everything at Disney moves, I said, excuse me, dude, I said, excuse me, but who are we? Are we yeah. Magic Mountain? Are we Universal? No. We're Disney. <laughs> <laughs> we're Disney. Excuse me? We're Disney. And Disney doesn't do that. Yeah. Excuse uh. me. Disney does not do that. So what are you talking about? And let's get this fixed. And he said, wow. you're, 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 you're preaching to the wrong guy. You have to talk to Tony Baxter. And I oh. said, so who is this t- Tony Baxter? Get him down here. <laughs> and he's like, you don't just get Tony Baxter down. He's in charge of all of Paris Disneyland. Well, where is he? I'll go see him then. You can't uh, just walk in on Tony Baxter. You have to make an appointment. I said, so make it. <laughs> Unless you're Terry Harden. What do we do? What do I do? What do I got to do? And he's like, okay, Terry, if I contact Tony and I have him come down to hear your argument and your pitch, 
can you keep it to 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, I'll do it. So he made the call and Tony was going to come down three days from that time. And I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. Well, down came Tony. Now, the Imagineering building is 1401 Flower. And that's where all the the big kahunas are. Your your Tony Baxter has an office. Marty Scalar had an office. All of the people that were maybe your concept artist, et cetera, et cetera, they all were there. But we were in what was called the Chastain building. And that began to multiply into all of the models that we sculpted and made for Paris. So you mm. had the amazing haunted mansion. Wow. You had the spectacular hedge maze. You had beautiful things from A to Z that began to populate this building as we, as projects were growing for Paris. Wow. So in walks Tony to the rock work division where I am working on big thunder. And, uh, he says, he walks up to me and he has an entourage. One of them puts a chair down for him. The other <laughs> makes sure he's comfortable. The other makes sure he has water. And others are just there in case he needs pen, pencil, pad, or the phone. Wow. So he, I stand uh, uh, opposite him. I am in a lab coat to keep the foam dust off of me. We carved in a lot of a, in a foam that looks like floral foam. So if you've ever had the green reservoir foam that people stick flowers in. This is the next grade up called gold foam. Mm. And gold foam is, and I have a picture of me actually working on the big, on uh, splash, splash, no big thunder mountain I'm working okay. on. It. And uh, you can see that the foam is gold. Well, it's gold because it has a little more pounds per inch, this is technical, but pounds per inch to press the foam together when you carve it so that it does not create static electricity. If you use the green foam, static electricity uh, is created and it sticks to your body. So very uncomfortable, really not cool. And if you're not someone who sculpts in foam and you get it in your eyes, it's like glass. So oh. this gold foam is really wonderful because it just falls to the ground and you can sweep it up because that extra couple of pounds per square inch is all the difference in the world. Wow. But back to our story where Tony sits looking at me and I'm standing in very much the starter position. An Olympic sprinter might stand. <laughs> and I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and he says, are you Terry? I say, yes. Are you Tony? He says, yes. I say, say go. He says, excuse me. I say, say go. He says, uh, <laughs> go <laughs> and i do this okay so this is what i think i think that this is ridiculous that the, that the dragon is is, is 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 not moving and i think it needs to be animated so here is my animated idea i think the head should do this i think the arm should do this i think the tail should do this the tail would be like a cat the, the arm would be like a dog and he goes wait 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 stop stop whoa whoa wow good lord <laughs> and i'm moving i'm acting out i'm gesturing i'm doing the whole thing and he says stop what are you doing and i go mr baxter i only have 20 minutes and you are cramping my time what is it? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, 20 minutes, eh? And I said, yes, I've got a lot to get through. And he says, if I give you more time, will you slow down? <laughs> and I said, what? what? Yeah. And so he allowed me to walk him through all my little sketches and my explanation of why the dragon paw twitches when it's dreaming and why the tail sweeps while it's oh. sleeping and why the head rises above. I, I had worked very hard on this. I really wanted this to happen. And he turned to me and he said, you know what? This is a great idea. Wow. Mm. And I think we should do it on one condition. And I was like, what's that? And he said, you got to design it. Oh, oh wow. Goodness and I gracious. said, I said, no, I can't do that. But yes, yes, I will. <laughs> I wanted to do it. And he also wanted a um, place for a photo op. And every time I've gone to Paris Disneyland or Disneyland Paris, as they call it now, back then it was called Euro Disneyland. When I went there, they, they had that chained off. So you couldn't really um, sit, but I designed a stalag 
stalagmites that you could sit down and then when you took the picture the dragon's head was in the little window over your shoulder Uh but they they've blocked that off so I actually when I went there in 2016 went under the chain and took a picture anyway and when they asked I said I'm the Imagineer who designed this. So <laughs> I'm the dragon's mom. Yeah. I'm the real mother of dragons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's our podcast name. <laughs> Carrie of- Harden, mother of dragons. <laughs> mother so, of dragons. So you're the inspiration for Daenerys on Game of Thrones. Yeah. Now yeah. it all makes sense. <laughs> let's, that- let's talk about the one show that I never miss is that oh. because of my- <laughs> Adore so, her and, and her dragons. And that's <laughs> why. Wow, that is fantastic. That yeah, is fantastic. so animation, I got to, ge- from the cement up, I designed the animation, I designed the look, I designed the cavern. And I walked through and there are things there that only I would remember because the guy who actually made it go big from my small model was a very good person and he st- he kept to my model to the letter And I just, the first time I saw it in 2000, I cried walking through the whole thing because it was, everything was my work, but big. Wow. Uh, Yeah. If, if anyone's going over to Euro Disney, you've got to, you've, or Disneyland Paris, I should say, Euro Disney. That's so 80s. Yeah. See, I got you. I got you. (laughs) Now you got me saying it. You've got to go see this dragon. You would think, and I'm still of the belief that that dragon was real. It was so, because he, he twitched. He he had a little burp, a little smoke came out. Yes, his head would move every once in a while. He would walk, and it's just so much fun it's watching. It's a she, sweetie. What, it's she. A she. Yes, oh, you know yes, what? you know it's so it's so cute that you say that because people ask me if I had named the dragon, and I said that's your job as as collectors and as enthusiasts. I want you to tell me because uh, I may be the mother of dragons, but you are the you help the dragon survive. By going mm. and seeing her, as I was told, she was a she. It's and, well, uh, there were certain areas of the dragon I didn't look at, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was well, trying no, to be but respectful. The, but the dragon is Maleficent. It's it's the Maleficent dragon. Okay, maybe I well, forgot about that, okay? I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because not really. Oh. See? And, and what happened was halfway through my project, if I may share this story with you, The powers that be of Disney Imagineering, and I don't mean Marty Scalar or Tony Baxter. Tony was actually in Paris when this happened. But there were a few show producers in between me and Tony. And they were kind of taking care of things while Tony was in Paris overseeing what he needed to to oversee. And uh, they came in and they saw me doing this whole design by myself. And they just freaked out. Oh, this woman is designing Mm. this whole thing. And they didn't say it like that, but that's kind of the impression that I got. So they immediately had a concept artist join me and redesign a lot of the areas that I had previously designed. Well, it wasn't a problem. That 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 wonderful concept artist was Brian Jowers. And Brian was a amazing concept artist. In fact, His paintings are so good, you can tell the time of day they were painted. So Uh I was just so thrilled to be working with this guy. And we brainstormed together to recreate something magical. I thought that Imagineering is collaboration. So I was so happy to have someone I could sit with and brainstorm with how we could take this Dragon's Lair to the next level. But before I made the change... I had a very good friend of mine tell me a story called The Green Chair, which when you want someone to buy off on your your illustration or your drawing, you put something really weird in there called that in this case, he put a green chair and they go, what's that green chair in there? And the artist will say, I don't know. And they'll remove it. And then you get to keep everything else. So he told me never throw anything out. If I cut, if I carve out the foam, hide the foam and then that way, if they change their mind, you can just put it back in and you look like you're really, really fast. See, I'm telling you all my secrets. <laughs> but uh, I don't mind. I'm always going to be straightforward and truthful. And uh, that's because it's, 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 it's me. So, right. so finally, there we are. And we come up with this amazing idea. As you walk in from one entrance and you make your way across at the bottom of the staircase that comes from Merlin's magic shop 
and you make your way over to the other entrance or exit, if you will, dependent on the direction you're going. Mm -hmm. You begin to see a skeleton embedded in the rock. First, you see a forked tail. Then as you come in, you realize that what's separating you from the dragon is a giant rib cage. Oh. Uh As you walk through the rib cage, you follow what appears to be vertebrae of a neck, and in the chest is a sword. Mm. (gasps) And then as you walk further, you see the skeletal skull. And then you realize what you realized, which is what? That that it, as Maleficent's dragon is already dead, or exactly, and that she's just in there and been decomposing, I suppose. Yes. Whoa. And oh wow! How amazing would this have been? How amazing that... because one of the things I learned about enthusiasts from Disney, because I are one, <laughs> is that you love to discover. Uh huh. You all love to discover. Just like you did. And look at how simple it was mm-hmm. as I simply describe it to you that you get it. Yeah. Well, there's always a story with Disney. Yes. And I love a story. And I thought it, and I said, Brian, this is good. Whoa. This is so good. For one thing, we don't have to have a cheesy chain link thing separating people. We have this rib cage that would be really cool. And, and, If they walk from the other end and see the head first, they're going to get equally as excited. They're going to want to see the rest. Either way propels you through because you just can't believe what you're seeing. Mm. As I can tell from your gasp, which made me very happy. Unfortunately, (laughs) the the people who uh, we showed this to didn't understand. (sighs) What? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? They, They didn't get it. And Brian and I scratched our head and we said, how can you, okay, let's tell the story again. Let's, this is the, the, so instead of saying a sword so that they would have the big aha, we said, it's the sort of truth. And they still looked at us like we were speaking a different language. And they, they made the decision that, uh, Brian was to go back to his corner and I was to bring the dragon's lair back to my design and they let me design it all by myself. So. Although this this is a gorgeous and fantastic dragon, and I'm so proud of her and everything. Sometimes people just don't get it, and mm. sometimes they're right there under the same Disney roof as as you are. Well, apparently and they weren't Disney enthusiasts. Yeah, I, it's it's just so strange. You know, it's it's just to this day, Brian and I were like, how how how? You know, it is called Sleeping Beauty's castle it right. could be a clue it could it, you know we're giving you huge clues <laughs> yeah Whoa. no kidding it must have been magic mountain moles <laughs> ah, it's yeah. hard to say, but <laughs> yeah i don't get it the- not good go back to the the uh, <laughs> inanimate object yeah go back to once you came make it a regular dragon <laughs> yeah but uh but so that's why this is a dragon who uh merlin met And they created a relationship with each other, which is why I didn't want the dragon to have a collar or a chain because I felt that Merlin was magical enough that the dragon would be there because of a mutual respect that they had for each other. But Disney didn't like that. So they gave her a collar and a, and a, and a chain restricting her. But I noticed the last time I was there, the chain was broken. Oh, so maybe they decided that they didn't really need that chain that even though she has a collar that her mutual respect with Merlin is still there because she could get out at any time. The little partition that separates you from her is not enough to keep you safe. So, um, (laughs) you know, so yeah. I I think this, I'm not just saying this, but I think that is the most spectacular attraction at any Disney park. Thank it's, you so much. It's just so, I can't say this mm-hmm. enough, it's so lifelike. And you can't do, a picture doesn't do it justice. No, we, we tried taking no. so many pictures, but none of them came out the no. way we could see it as you're right there. And yeah, maybe and that was their, their intention. Like, oh, hey, yeah. let's make this so no one can get a good picture. Get to come and visit it firsthand. It's enough to make you want to see her because I've said to people, what's the best castle of all the Disney parks? And everybody says their own castle. But mm. that's not true. It's the Paris Castle. Why? <laughs> because the Paris Castle has a dragon under it. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, and that's, that's the trump card. It is. And many people go through the castle and don't know she's under there. Mm-hmm. Really a surprise to me. You got to follow that sign, La Tanière du Dragon or something like that. Yeah. I don't speak and French I'm, at all. No kidding. I'm so happy that it's like that because I wanted the Disney enthusiasts to be able to discover her. Yeah. And well. so now they do because it's so understated that unless you happen to be, you know, with me, mm. you don't get to do it. And I actually have created a retreat in which I'm going to take people to Disneyland. I'm going to meet them in Paris and we're going to go to Disneyland, Disneyland Paris. And we're also going to spend three days in Paris. And I have a few spots left. Whoa. And uh, if you're willing to go for, uh, you know, the price tag isn't low, but that's because you get to spend, you know, five days with an Imagineer tell it, giving you all the secrets and taking you through Paris to show you what you want. So, And when is this? September 10th through the 14th. All uh, right. Of this year, I yeah, take it. Of this year. And uh, if you want, I can send you a flyer. Sure uh, the idea, The idea is to that you meet me in Paris. So if you live there, you can walk over. If you don't, you have to get yourself there. But the reason for that is because I want to create the ultimate. I will create the ultimate VIP experience. And there's only room for nine more people. The total is 13. Wow. Okay. And can you give us a ballpark about how much this Price would tag? run? If you are single occupancy, it's just a touch over six grand. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But it's really worth it because... You're going to get to walk with an Imagineer, get to talk with Imagineer. You've got me for the full five days. Your undivided attention, very small group. Yeah. That's one of the reasons it, it is what it is. And I want to do things you wouldn't do if you went over there. Right. So I want to show you some things in Paris that you may not have done for whatever reason. So we might not go see the classic touristy spots, but I'm going to take you to some amazing areas that I've learned and, uh, places that I've experienced and things that you can get your hands dirty that uh, I've discovered. I've been to Paris five times because I love that city. Mm. And then you get to walk through Dragon's Lair and, and hear what I have. And you get to walk, the, you know, see Big Thunder and we'll ride it together and we'll experience it together. And, wow. and uh, story, 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 story. So, well, you know what? That, I would say that's worth it. That's, it that's, really a, is. that's a good price yeah. tag for such, it, such intimate stories. It, mm -hmm. it seriously is. I mean, if you want to go to Paris on a nutshell, you're going to ride the underground. You're going to do the various things on your own. But this, you're going to be driven everywhere. You're going to be catered to. I'm going to take you to places that are deep within Paris that many don't know about, like a mm -hmm. can that like a jewelry store that ends up being a candy store and things like that. So some real fun surprises and some real things in store. I'm really going to do it up VIP. So um, if you are someone who's going to go with someone, then it's less. So I'll send you the flyer and you, anyone who's interested can take a look at it, but I wanted it to be single occupancy because a lot of times I travel by myself. My husband works. And so a lot of times I can't take him with me. So I got tired of trying to book like say a cruise or something and single occupancy, the price goes up. Right. So I thought it was better to say single occupancy and there's two of you, it goes down. And you're going to be, okay. woohoo, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And $700, sold, $700 holds your spot. And then you can make payments all the way up until we go. And so we're we're very accommodating. We understand that it's an investment, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You know, there's no guarantees I'm going to do it again. Uh, it all depends. This is, this is inaugural, meaning it's my first. Oh. And you get a sculpture from me wow. that is going to be given to you, only limited to the 15th, the... 13 people who are going. So that in itself, you could probably resell if you wanted to and get, you know, some of your money back. So mm. seriously, it's, it's a no brainer just, and I have about 20 people who are interested in filling those nine spots, but they haven't as of this time pulled the trigger. Right. So the faster you do it, the faster, you know, $700 settles it and, and we are going. So it's going to be a great adventure. Now, if the Skywalkers out there want to jump in on this, where do they go to? They go to Terry, terryharden.com, and they can put their email in there. Or you can find me on Facebook and message me. Okay. And Harden so, is H-A-R-D-I-N. Yes, and Terry is T-E-R-R-I. So okay. I have a Terry Harden fan page, at Terry Harden fan page on Facebook. 
So you can go there and say, look, I want one of these flyers. I really want to do this. And I'll get one out to you. Or you can just say, I got my 700 bucks. Let's do this thing. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll make it happen for you because it's, it's filling. The only reason it hasn't filled up yet is because I had some family stuff that I had to take care of first. And I've kind of been a little slow in talking to all the people who are interested. So that my, you know, that is your game. The faster, the better, you know, but it's going to be fantastic. And I, I'm very excited about, about getting together with the real hardcore fans to do some really intimate, uh, Paris yeah. experience, both at the park. You know, somebody said, are we shopping? Well, we're going to be two days at, at Disneyland Paris. So we can stop <laughs> yeah. and you can experience and we can really dig deep. So absolutely. Yeah. Someone asks you if you're going to go shopping, you, you say, say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, come on. This is Grant Paris. Oh, yes. definitely, yeah. Well, wow. these have been such tremendous stories, and th thank you very much. So now let's wrap it up by giving out some social media information. Where can fans find you on, on Twitter and Facebook and, and websites? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I just learned this. <laughs> 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 you can find me. My, I just got a you. I just. Uh, uh, created a YouTube channel. And although, uh, I have not yet put a lot of my own personal videos up there and eventually I will have classes there for you to learn how to sculpt and draw and do all things puppety and all that kind of stuff. But for now, I did a huge playlist, which contains a lot of my podcasts and interviews and also has my foster farms chickens, which if you're on the East Coast, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But you can go through the playlist and see some of the things I'm doing. And I'm throwing in movies that I've worked in, little clips of things like that, uh, information and things like that. So you can go through the playlist right now, and then I will continue to upload. So please subscribe. And it's just uh, YouTube.com slash C slash Terry Harden Speaks. That's how you mm. can find the channel. And awesome. uh, then on Twitter, I'm at T as in Tom Hardin, H-A-R-D-I-N, Forms, F-O-R-M-S. That's where you can find me on Twitter. You'll know it because I have Guillermo del Toro and I standing together as he looks at my artwork. Nice. On Facebook, you can go to Terry Harden fan, at Terry Harden fan page at the Facebook. On Instagram, it's uh, 24, the number 24, fit, F-I-T, Terry, T E R R I. And then I think that's, uh, and LinkedIn is probably, I don't know what LinkedIn is, but most, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that the reason there are so many different tags is because, uh, I, I was doing these early, 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 and then I had absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And in some cases, I still don't. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm learning. So, uh, Twitter, you know, Twitter, I had quite a few followers. So I said, well, I could change my channel, but then I lose all my followers. So I just kept it at T Harden forms and, uh, just tell people how to find me. And then Facebook page, finally got a Facebook page up and you can just hit me up there and say, I start or listen to you on skywalking through Neverland and would love to connect. And of course I'm going to let you do that. And then, um, yeah. And then guys, uh, cherry at, you know, cherry at cherry .com If you want to email me, T E R R I at T E R R I H A R D I N dot com. So in when in doubt, Google me. <laughs> <laughs> and some of those things will pop up. Oh, right, they well. will. Uh, <laughs> well, we can't wait to have you back on the show and seeing how you just live up the five freeway. We'll yeah. get together sometime. Yeah, we should. We should have lunch or we should, you know, maybe we can do a podcast where we're all sitting in the same spot, which could be fun. Yeah. But then, you know, people better put their bunny slippers on because you can't. <laughs> you know, then <laughs> sign off. But no, I, 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 this happens a lot to a podcast because the threads all thread through so many different things that I'm sitting there going, gosh, who is this person that's done all this stuff? Oh, wait, me? Really? <laughs> uh, I, well, I, yeah. I'm surprised, but it, it all started. It all started with a dream. One man whose dog was named Chewy and he never gave up George Lucas went and found one guy that's all it takes to change your life and mr lad said okay let's make this strange thing called star wars and the rest is history and so like disney george lucas was a life-changing effect in all of our lives 
and uh, never, never forget the the man behind the curtain. All right. Well, once again, thank you for all your stories. They were they were fantastic, and we can't wait to have you on the show again. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Shout outs, Skywalker. Shout outs. Which Skywalkers get props from here in Neverland? Who was tweeted out? Shout out. Who was photoballed? Shout out. Who was shared a post? Shout out. Now, someone on Twitter was looking for podcast recommendations, and Ryan, who is at iRebelRyan, I'm sure it's iRebelRyan, tweeted out, at Skywalking Pod, if you want to come out of a podcast smiling from awesome Star Wars and Disney content. <laughs> I love that one. I know. It's so sweet. Well, I love it. Thank you, I Rebel Ryan. Yeah. Awesome. And then we're sticking with Twitter for this shout out session. And Michelle, who is at Mish Bell, tweeted, here's my weird compliment for you two for the week. You have such animated but soothing voices. It's like that cool librarian that used to read to your class when you were in elementary school. I, I love this one too. <laughs> but now you got to take the form and you have to read that with an animated and soothing voice. I just did. According to her, that's just how our voices are. All right. Well, you know what? Try to, try to play into it. Why don't, why don't you do it? All right. You have such animated but soothing voices. It's like that cool librarian that used to read to your class when you were in elementary school. Yes, that was nice. Was that animated and cool? I think <laughs> our voices are already like that, so we don't have to worry about it. I know, but you know what? I, I just want to give her what she wants. Maybe, maybe you're the animated one, and I'm the soothing <laughs> what one. What are you talking about? I think that's just true. Yeah? Go on. That's what I'm going to say, and I'm sticking to it. All right. <laughs> well, you have a very nicely animated voice as well. Okay. Why don't you read the next one? All right. Jeffrey Fishbach, he tweeted out a selfie while at work and said, I took a time out from work. Shh. To send my friends at Skywalking Pod a selfie. Yay. We love those. And we love it when you tweet out your Skywalker selfie. So if you're on Instagram or or Twitter... Now, we're going we're gonna to expand this to Instagram, okay. all right? Because we are at Skywalking Pod on Instagram. We want you to hashtag your Skywalker selfie. So stop what you're doing. Take a selfie of yourself and whatever you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yay, smile. And then we want you to post it on Instagram or Twitter and tag us. Just tag at Skywalking Pod and write in there hashtag Skywalker selfie and tell us whatever you're doing. Yay. All right, Skywalkers, well, we want to hear from you, too, not just in a tweet, but maybe a Facebook post we can do, Sarah, telling us what you want to see in future Skywalking Through Neverland episodes. Well, what you want to hear. What you want to hear. Specifically. Yes, yes. So, like, some discussion topics. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah. We want to know what, like, do you have questions for us that you want answered? We need, we need some discussion topic, like, ideas, because we've, we've heard that people like to hear us discussing things. Yeah, we, we've got a lot planned for mm -hmm. the future. Yeah. Even working with Lucasfilm on a couple of things. But you know what? We still want to hear from the Skywalkers, and we want to give you what you want. So, Sarah, should they tweet at us at something special or just tweet at us in general? Well, for discussion topics, I would say, yeah, they can either tweet at us or, like, in our group, maybe post. We're, we're going to make a post in our group, our Facebook group. So... If you're not a part of that group, please search Facebook for Skywalking Through Neverland group and then request to join and then answer the two questions because it's a closed group. So we're going to put a post up there. We're going to pin it mm -hmm. to the top and, and ask what kind of discussion topics or questions you'd like us to cover. All or right. Maybe even guests we want to have. You want to you want us to have on. That's true, but but more we need we need discussion topics. So yeah. so Star Wars, Disney, Marvel, you know, bathroom tile, Harry Potter, whatever. Yeah, we want to discuss it. All, All right, right Skywalkers, you're more more of the show than almost we are at this point. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know. Yeah, you you have discussions on Facebook. You tweet each other out. You have your own meetups. Mm -hmm. So Skywalkers, <laughs> we're one big happy family. Yes. Oh, we love it. Well, that wraps up our fun-filled episode 222 of Skywalking Through Neverland. And we would like to thank Terry Harden for giving us so much of her time. I mean, how long is this episode? Well, her 
her discussion, unedited, was two and a half hours. Yeah. If not a few minutes after that. Wow. And we still didn't get to <laughs> <laughs> the, the big stuff. Uh-huh. So, yeah. But she, it's coming. It's she coming. She was amazing, and she has just great, great stories. And, of course, we'd like to thank all of you Skywalkers for listening every single week. Now, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, which, Richard, we are currently posting something from a Planet of the Apes event you attended. Yeah, as we speak, we are uploading to YouTube a panel I saw last night with Dana Gould. Now, Dana Gould, he is a comedian, he is, he's a, a Simpsons writer, and he just wrote Planet of the Apes Visionaries, which which is a, a graphic novel that was adapted from the original Rod Serling Planet of the Apes script. Wow. Yes, and then they finally adapted it into a, to a graphic novel. And Dana Gould was the one that adapted it. And he's going to be a guest on Talking Apes in the near future. <gasps> I had a good discussion with him last night, and he's very excited to be on. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so head over to our YouTube channel for that video of that discussion. All right, you can also help support us. So under the Support Us tab on skywalkingthroughneverland.com, we have links to Pozu Shoes, RT Public Shop, and Oppo, Oppo Suits. Oppo? Oppo. And Oppo Suits. Now, clicking through these links to buy really helps us out. All right. You know what? Going back over here to the face huggers. Uh-huh. Uh, Brianna just chimed in and said, hey, I'm the one that camped out with y'all at D23. Yay! You well, know what? Thanks for joining us, I Brianna. I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Brianna. <laughs> How exciting. Well, good to see you again, or see your name again. Yes. All right, we are at Skywalking Pod on Twitter and Instagram, and we have our Facebook group. So there's discussions happening there all the time. Uh, our Skywalkers are posting pictures or, or things that are happening in their lives that are fun, and also forming meetups is really great. And you can email us. We are share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. Justin saw Dana Gould and Adam Carolla show. Oh, He's okay. always on Adam Carolla. Yes. Extremely hilarious. Now, are there bloopers and other fun conversation after the credits? I'm sure. I'm sure there are. <laughs> but it, there, like I was saying before, there is a, a nugget we had to take out of the show about how Terry Harden had worked on Star Tours. Oh yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we'll get the full story later on. But you want to hear a little little nugget? Listen afterwards, and I'm sure there's going to be some bloopers too. Yay! Hey, Eric Warren. And Skywalkers. So thanks for joining us today. And yay, we're back to recording in midweek. It's yes. very exciting. And and the, and the Skywalkers can join us over there on Apple Podcasts. Oh, yes. We need to read some more iTunes reviews. Okay. So, Apple Podcast reviews. Apple. Okay. Apple Pod. Just strike I... iTunes from your vocabulary for podcasting. I don't okay. know why. It's so silly. go over to Apple Podcasts. Yes. And please leave us a review. We'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. And Skywalkers, always remember... Never land on Alderaan Some imagination, huh? <laughs> to our Skywalkers and Tweetwalkers, thanks for listening. Skywalking Through Neverland is created and produced by Richard and Sarah Woloski. Original music by Rob Dellinger. Creative consultant, Mark Ogushwitz. Technical advisor, Peter Heitman. Facebook administrators, Donald Wicks, Joey Pittman, and Norma Heitman. Skywalking Through Neverland is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Any sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is property of Skywalking Through Neverland, all rights reserved. Sorry, had to be said. And before you email it, all you can do... Well, meh, the voice memo thing. Did you yeah. say that? Uh, you can reiterate it. Yeah. Okay. So, so now I would like to circle back to the Empire Strikes Back one sheet poster you had one in that Bantha Tracks. Oh my God! All right, let me try that again. And Skywalker's <laughs> Sorry. drywall dust. Uh oh. So now I'd like to segue into Star Tours and Captain EO because okay. I know you've worked on both of those. So what kind of stories do you have there?
Well, Star Tours, I have a very funny story because although I didn't work on the show, well, I kind of did. I did it for, for Tokyo Disneyland. Uh, my, my associate and I, my associate's name is Lynette Eklund. She and I made an Admiral Akbar. So we sculpted him for, uh, their version of the Star Tours in, um, Tokyo. Wow. I, I can't remember exactly when that was, but we also did Pan Galactic Pizza where we made all the puppets and then we performed all the puppets for Tokyo. And, uh, it was a pizza parlor that was right outside of Star Tours and all the little alien characters would fly in on the screen and order pizza. And then the little pizza delivery men would go out and deliver deliver this pan galactic pizza. And uh, they were all very interesting characters. And there was one in particular that would order the pizza so he could eat the delivery guys. Uh-huh. So <laughs> there's all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But uh-huh. anyway, uh, EO was a, was a dream come true because George Lucas was very concerned about this somewhat crazy woman who had sat through Star Wars 181 times. <laughs> oh, so he knew you. He knew you then. He knew of me. He remembered you. Oh, great. He knew of me. And 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 I remember a friend of mine who had who had met him and he said, I just don't know if I want to meet Terry Harden. She sounds rather uh. bizarre. Oh, and, come on. Uh, uh, <gasps> hey, Okay, so we can stop recording this, right? Because I'll we'll take him over to see the tile. <laughs> do you guys, guys want to see the bathroom now? Yeah, now if you're watching us live, we're going to take you over to the bathroom. Okay, all right, bye. Okay. All right, you can press stop. Okay, who brought the dog? <laughs>